Welcome to our second video in a series addressing the use of beams in integrated systems. This is video 06.6-B, the B indicating that it's the second in the series. In this particular video we're going to focus on the use of precast double T's, precast hollow core planks, and precast L-beams. As mentioned in a previous video, this is a diagram of the standard design procedure or design approach for multi-story buildings. There's a volume that's allocated for structure and the presumption is that no other systems encroach, encroach on that volume, typically. Then there's a volume below that for the ductwork and other HVAC equipment. And then there's a volume below that for the ceiling and electrical fixtures. In typical applications, the overall depth of this so-called sandwich between the floor, surface, and the ceiling below is on the order of five to six feet. That can vary tremendously, of course, depending on the spans that are involved and the size of the building, which influences things like the dimension of the ductwork. But five to six feet is not uncommon, and sometimes it even goes above that. Um, this is what I would refer to as a, a not well integrated system and that and it was designed to be that way to allow each of the engineering specialties to do their jobs without worrying about sharing volume with the other engineering specialties we'd like to talk about the benefits of integration though because five or six feet for the sandwich uh, structure every floor adds up very quickly so if we can make some significant reductions in the overall height of the sandwich, that will be a very significant economic benefit. It can allow us to lower the height of the building and raise the height of the ceiling, which allows us to get better daylight and a, and a more airy, uh, better quality space for the occupants of the building. I want to emphasize that this notion of systems integration many architecture students will think of as a pretty technical topic. And many of you will think that this is something that you should be able to delegate to your technical team members. Keep in mind though, that the structural person is called a specialist for a reason. That person deals almost exclusively with structure. And similarly, the HVAC specialist deals almost exclusively with HVAC. None of these people are in charge of integrating the design. The architect is in charge of integrating the design. So if the architect turns his back or her back on this design problem and leaves it to the engineering specialties, this kind of sandwich panel uh, or sandwich uh, arrangement is exactly what you will end up with. So in a previous uh, video, we talked about a steel system with steel joists that work in composite action with the uh, concrete deck, a series of steel girders running in the north-south direction, uh, a plenum volume under the floor, under the access floor, and a plenum ceiling where the return air through the ceiling comes back between these steel joists. In that system, we were able to reduce the floor sandwich, which is from the ceiling of the space below to the top surface of the floor above to something in the order of three foot two inches or three foot four inches, which is substantially better than the five to six feet, which is typical. In the previous discussions, we also showed a similar kind of structure or arrangement basically made from precast elements. Again, we had about a 30 foot span from column to column along this wall. 
We used uh, deep girders in the, in the form of a rigid frame to span the 60 feet from the south wall to the north wall. Um, and we did these as rigid precast units so that the rigid frame action would provide lateral bracing. Um, this was an all concrete structure and a fairly innovative one and one that would work fine. It had special shapes like these hollow beams which uh, provide some storage volume and, um, and uh, equipment volume but which would have to be specially made. So we want to talk about a few other ways of doing things that might rely on uh, an assemblage of parts which are more common in the precast industry. So one of the ones we've talked about is the classic double T. And what we've said is that if you get a, a double T that's 32 inches deep plus a topping layer would bring it to 34 inches deep. With such a system, we're able to span, for example, 60 feet and support uh, safely a superimposed live load of 82 uh, pounds per square foot uh, with a simple uh, undepressed uh, strand pattern. If we go to a depressed strand pattern, we can support uh, even much more than that. But for many applications, 82 pounds a square foot is adequate. So one of the beauties to double T's is that they can span these long distances and we can simplify the construction and simplify the architectural arrangement inside by spanning 60 feet without any interior columns. So here's what something like that might look like. Here we have perimeter columns on the north and the south portion of the building. Uh, we have very tall glass. And the basic structure would look something like this. Here we have a concrete L-beam with a ledger on the bottom. In this case, it's about six feet deep. Here we have the double T. This is the top surface of the double T. This is the bottom of the rib. Um, it's an unbelievably simple system that consists of simple columns, L-beams on each side, and double T's spanning the 60 feet in between. So the overall depth of these double T's, including the topping layer, is 34 inches. Now, this next drawing up shows uh, the addition of a bunch of uh, parts. So this is the basic structural scheme here. And this is, as we mentioned, the bottom of the double T. So when we go up here, that's this line across here. What we've introduced now is a hung ceiling at this level. We've put in a supply air uh, duct or a trunk line that's running east-west along the building. Between the ribs of the double T's, we've introduced these uh, supply air feeder ducts, which might be round ducts or square. Um, but whatever the case, we have to have some sort of opening from the supply air duct. So we're showing one here and one there feeding into the supply air feeder ducts that are running in the north-south direction. So our trunk line runs in the east-west direction, or in other words, perpendicular to the plane of this image. And the supply air feeder ducts run in the north-south direction, uh, as shown. Um, Air, in this case, is delivered through the ceiling, supply air. It swirls around the space and returns uh, through this ceiling plenum, ceiling plenum. So the return air plenum volume is above the ceiling and below the bottom of the ribs. It's not a very deep volume, but it's very wide. It basically covers the entire width of the space. So it's a pretty effective um, volume for returning air. Now this system is some people believe not thermally ideal because in order for it to work you have to project air into the space and thoroughly mix the air before it returns 
because you have the supply and return at the top. In previous games, we looked at floor plenums that delivered air or supply air through the floor and took it out through the ceiling. The philosophy of that is that stagnant air tends to move vertically and collect at the ceiling because it has, is associated in many instances with plumes that come off of people's bodies, which is one of the sources of odor and contamination in the air. So the idea is to deliver air low and take it out near the ceiling. Um, there are people though who feel that underfloor volumes are dirty, that they can harbor uh, various uh, biological agents and they would rather have the supply air at the top and the return air at the top. So there are arguments in favor of both systems. This one is probably the most common uh, to both supply and return at the ceiling, um, but they're all viable. So we're going to draw a few examples of this um, so that you can keep in mind that there are these options that do exist. So. Again, we have the ceiling, the return air plenum, the supply air feeder duct, the supply air trunk line. The overall depth of this sandwich is three feet, six inches, which is actually quite good when you think that we're spanning an entire 60 feet from one side of this building to the other, and we have no interior columns. We've gotten the ceiling up really high for admitting daylight and the only place that the ceiling comes down lower is at the center of the building where you're probably going to have a circulation space or, or something that's effectively a corridor so that you don't need as much light there as you might need in the more occupied workspaces uh, on the south side here and on the north side there. So from a simplicity point of view, this is an extraordinarily a uh, simple structure which has no interior columns, spans the full 60 feet, and still only has a sandwich depth of 3 feet 6 inches. We also have talked about hollow core planks. So here we have an 8 inch deep hollow core plank with a 2 inch topping layer for an overall depth of 10 inches. And when we look down here we see we can easily span 30 feet and support 88 pounds a square foot with a very modest strand pattern and with a little more we can go to 110 pounds uh, per square feet. So and 30 feet is not a, a bad span in the sense that we're trying to get a building that's on the order of 60 feet from north to south. We're trying to not go beyond that for daylighting reasons. So a 30 foot span can be pretty reasonable to work with. Um, we also have 12 inch deep hollow core planks and they can span even further um, easily up to 40 feet. So here we have one that's supporting 93 pounds a square foot or 105 pounds a square foot at 45 feet with a flat or, or um, an undraped or flat um, pre-stressed cable. Um, for what we're going to do, we're going to draw it with the 12 inch hollow core plank because we'd like openings in it that are big enough to conduct air. So here's a scheme. The basic structure looks like this. We have an L beam here. We have columns on the perimeter, columns flanking a corridor space down the center of the building. We have L beams spanning from column to column at both the north and the south wall and then also down the corridor and we wouldn't normally need an L-beam here because there's not much to support but in a second it'll become clear why we're doing that but both these L-beams are deep enough this one is 4 foot 10 as it's drawn this one is 4 foot 4 and they can span substantial distances uh, between columns uh, where these beams are running in the east-west direction. So in the next diagram up, this is the basic structure. We keep that same basic structure, but we add a few, few elements. 
one of which is this hung ceiling. And we've given it an interesting shape here. First, it comes off at the level of the bottom of this L beam, so you get a nice smooth transition on the ceiling. This plenum volume can accept air and conduct it back to this volume, which then becomes the duct trunk line for the return air. So the return air is going east and west, or you know, if the supply air is going west, the return air here is flowing back towards the east. So we have a return air volume or plenum uh, above the ceiling and below the ribs of the double T, and that should not say double T, that should say hollow core planks, so that was a mistake uh, in copying over some text. Um, so the air returns through openings in the ceiling. In this scheme, we're talking about using the hollow cores as feeder ducts to supply air, which would go up through the floor to the space above via slots in the top of the hollow core plank. If we use this system, we have this extraordinarily shallow sandwich of one foot, 10 inches, which accommodates structure, feeder ducts, and return air plenum, all within that very shallow volume. So with a very conventional 14 foot, eight inches from floor to floor, as the story dimension, we're able to get a 12 foot, 10 inch ceiling. Or we can stick with this scheme and, and say we're less interested in daylighting, but we really want to save on the height of the building, in which case we can drop this 14 foot, eight inches, um, a few feet. In order to do that, we'll have to reduce the height of this supply trunk line and reduce the depth of these L-beams somewhat because the limitation here becomes the eight foot, eight inches here, which if we, if we dropped it a foot, that becomes uh, seven foot, eight inches. We could take that all the way down to seven feet, actually, uh, depending upon the nature of this corridor. If the corridor is fully enclosed, you don't want it to be seven feet, but if you can have views out on either side, seven feet is actually not disturbing at all from a perceptual point of view. In the case of this system, this, these are the hollow core planks there and there. And then here we just have a solid slab, which is mounted in a notch in the hollow core planks. And this allows the support of the floor. And it also allows air from this volume or this volume right here to access these cores. This is giving us 30 foot deep spaces on the south and the north, and then an eight foot corridor space. Now, the drawback to this system is that a lot of people are very uncomfortable having their supply air, which sometimes comes in cool and moist, flowing through a concrete core which tends to absorb moisture and become a growth opportunity for mold and other biological agents that are not very desirable. And so we often feel the need to be able to get to our um, air conduits and examine them and clean them out. And so these hollow cores don't lend themselves very well to that. But we can take this same basic concept and we can modify it by putting in uh, an access floor with an air supply plenum underneath it. And so that scheme would look like this. So we've, we've uh, modified the structure slightly in that we're going to add an access floor about a foot above. Normally, we'd need a little more than that if it was going to require ducts, but here the, the supply air only has to flow about 30 feet to get to the perimeter of the building. So we don't need ducts, and we can just live with this plenum volume of a foot deep. And so that plenum volume will look like this. 
Um, so we've uh, put in an access floor which gives us a plenum volume that's one foot high. And now air from the supply air duct goes up through this slab. And by the way, this slab might not even be a slab anymore. It might be uh, some beams that just support the portion of the access floor that exists in this corridor. Uh, the access floor consists of pedestals every 24 inches on center and, um, and support structure for the floor that spans between those pedestals. Those tiles in the floor do not span any more than 24 inches. And so these pedestals have to be supported. And so this could be a series of four inch deep uh, steel beams that span across that corridor dimension and support the pedestals. But however we do that, air has to pass from the supply air duct trunk line up into the plenum volume and flow towards the south to supply this space and flow towards the north to supply this space. And again, we're supplying air low and taking it out in the plenum volume high. Now we've done all of that and we've got a floor sandwich of two feet, 10 inches, which again is very efficient and it's leaving us a floor to ceiling dimension of 11 feet, 10 inches. And again, we can decide whether we want to take advantage of this for daylighting or whether we want to uh, lower the overall story dimension as an economy measure to reduce the cost of the building. One comment I'll make here is you'll notice this piece was not rendered in the original structural in the basic structural diagram here. And the reason is that this is not so much a structural element as it is a concrete element that provides the fire break between this space and the supply air duct, which is supplying air to the space above, or in this case, the supply air duct is going into this plenum volume. The air is going into this plenum volume. So to create the fire isolation, we need the hollow core plank, the girder, and this concrete slab. And that concrete slab, by the way, is the reason we chose the L beam is because that slab weighs enough that we need some kind of uh, structural ledger on which to support it. That ends our second video, video 06.6B, on beams in integrated systems.